Uh, this event has been brought to you by the combined efforts of Sanctuary Nature Foundation, Godridge, and the Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies. Before I start, I would like a speaker each from the sponsor to address us briefly, please. And I would request Mr. Adi Godridge to come and please uh, speak to us on behalf of Godridge. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to sponsor anything done by Sanctuary, which does such a fantastic job in terms of preservation of nature. And I don't want to take your time and just say that I look forward to hearing this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I now request uh, Rohini Nilakani, please? Sarvan Namaza Namaskar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Mumbai, as always, and uh, great to have joined the Sanctuary Foundation, Bittu, who I think with the Sanctuary magazine since 1981 has been so much a part of our conscience about preservation, diversity, and so many conservation of wildlife and other things. So very pleased to partner with all of you on this, looking forward to a sharp debate. I think there's never been a more critical time uh, for um, the issues of Samaj and Bazaar to come together when it comes to biodiversity, when it comes to economic security. So looking forward to a really sharp debate. Hopefully the goal of debates is not so much to take people further apart, but to help bridge uh, across divides. Looking forward, thank you, namaskar. Thank you. Now I'm going to take my seat here as the chair for the So as you know, uh, the proposition for the day is, this house believes that India's economic security is being undermined by, by biodiversity protection concerns. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers and request them to come and take their place on stage. I'll start with, for the motion, Rohit Bansal, Head Group Communications, Reliance Industries Limited, Rohit Bansal is a media leader and influencer, multiple TEDx speaker, and a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. <laughs> Rohit is an alum of Harvard Business School and St. Stephen's College. He serves on the National Executive of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and co-chairs the e-commerce committee. His expertise is at the intersect of government and regulation, media, social media, reputation, Corporate Communications, Strategy, Alliances, and Legal Affairs. Thank you, Rohit, and welcome. The second speaker for the motion is Mr. R. Mukundan, Managing Director and CEO, Tata Chemicals. R. Mukundan is the Managing Director and CEO of Tata Chemicals. An engineer from IIT Roorkee, he's an alum of the Harvard Business School as well. Mr. Mukundan joined the TAS, the Tata Administrative Service, after completion of an MBA from FMS Delhi University. During his 26-year career with the Tata Group, he has held various responsibilities across the chemical, automotive, and hospitality sectors of the group. He serves on executive committees of various industry forums, with the uh, CII, Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Employers Federation of India, All India Management Association, etc. Thank you for being here, Mr. Mukundan, and welcome. The third speaker for the evening is Mr. Ajit Gulabchan, Chairman and Managing Director, Hindustan Construction Company. <laughs> Ajit Gulabchan, Chairman and Managing Director, hails from a family of nation builders who have contributed to the development of modern India for over a century. HCC plays a leading role in meeting the huge infrastructure needs of India and innovation-led next practices. Corporate social responsibility is intrinsic to Mr. Gulabchand's vision for HCC Group. Its initiatives encompass disaster relief, water, education, health, and community initiatives. With a view to make water sustainability a priority, Mr. Gulabchand became the first Asian signatory 
to endorse the United Nations CEO water mandate. HCC has implemented a series of water management practices at its project site. Welcome, Mr. Gulabchand, and thank you for being here. Those against the motion, uh, I'll first call on Mr. Nitin Desai, former Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, and former Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. Mr. Nitin Desai, a graduate of the London School of Economics, taught economics at two UK universities, worked briefly in the private sector, had a long stint as a government official in India, where his last job was as Secretary and Chief Economic Advisor in the Finance Ministry. At the international level, Mr. Desai worked in the Brundtland Commission, where he drafted the key chapters dealing with sustainable development, and then joined the United Nations in 1990, from where he retired in 2003 as the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Currently, he's a member of the National Broadcasting Standards Authority and writes a monthly column in the Business Standard. Thank you, Mr. Desai, for being here. Welcome. <laughs> Our next speaker against the motion is Bittu Saigal, founder and managing director, Sanctuary Nature Foundation, a man who has had more than four decades of <laughs> conservation and wildlife in his blood. <laughs> Welcome, Bittu. Thank you for being here. And last but not the least, May I call upon Vandana Shiva, physicist, founder of Navdanya, eco-feminist, author and global food security expert. <laughs> Dr. Vandana Shiva <laughs> is trained as a physicist and did her PhD on the subject hidden variables and non-locality in quantum theory from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. After shifting to interdisciplinary research in science, technology, and environmental policy, she founded Navdanya, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources. Dr. Shiva combines the sharp intellectual inquiry with courageous activism. In 2003, Time magazine identified her as an environmental hero, and Asia Week has called her one of the five most powerful communicators of Asia. Forbes magazine in November 2010 identified Dr. Vandana Shiva as one of the top seven most powerful women on the globe. Welcome, Vandana, and thank you for being here. Okay, a uh, few things, uh, house rules. One, I presume all of you have this card. It's in the magazine. And just so that we are not confused, I will repeat again that this, when you say for the motion, you're actually for the statement, this house believes that India's economic security is being undermined by biodiversity protection concerns. So uh, if you're saying I support the motion, then you do this. And if you're against this motion, you do that when I ask for a vote. Uh, I'm going to ask for a vote before we start and then see how these speakers have influenced our evening. Uh, secondly, the format is uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, I'm going to call upon uh, Mr. Gulabchand first, and he speaks for the motion for a four-minute period. I will remind him at the, the moment the clock hits three minutes. Uh, so he speaks for four, then I call uh, Vandana uh, to do the same uh, against the motion, so four minutes, and we switch like that till all the speakers are done. And then we have uh, uh, a rebuttal, because they get the opportunity to hear everyone on both their side and against. Uh, so they get three minutes each again in the same format. I call on Mr. Gulabchand, I shift to Ms. Uh, Vandana, and so on. After which, I will stop and open the floor to the house. You can ask some questions of the speakers. Um, of course, uh, we would request that we don't have too many opinions. Uh, it should be a question, and it should be preferably addressed to someone specific. Um, and of course, you should identify yourself. Uh, and then, 
we leave with each speaker being given an opportunity again for a period of three minutes to actually uh, make some concluding remarks. And then, of course, I will have a vote uh, asking what the final verdict is in terms of how these speakers have influenced you and your thinking. So thank you. And uh, before we get started, may I uh, take a vote? Can I have the lights, please? Because I can't see a thing. OK. So for the motion in the audience supporting this side, how many cards? So it's about four, six, another 15 here, 10. About, yeah, and some there. OK, against the motion? <laughs> OK. Whoa. You've got your task cut out. OK, uh, are we ready to go? Vandana Bittu, Mr. Desai. Mr. Gulabchand, the floor is yours. Those of us who have been in the industry as well as concerned about the development of our country have always been in the minority in such debates, as is evident from the, the hands that went up. But that does not mean that we are not right, that we also have a stake in what we are doing, and we genuinely believe that the development and biodiversity concerns must be well balanced. It can't be. We all are of the opinion that the world should be a better place, a better, cleaner place. The impact of climate change could be avoided, could be, could be adapted to. There are several measures to be taken. And the journey so far has created some wonderful new ideas and new experiments that have given us a great amount of, of improvement in our environment. On the other hand, when you come to biodiversity, some people feel that biodiversity is just now, we have now milked the climate change issue long enough. Now we need another issue to be activists about. And that is what is a bigger concern. You have, there are some genuine activists, but there are others too, who have almost created a religion out of saying, this is the only way, and a monotheistic religion. This is what we say, and everybody needs to believe in that, and nobody who speaks against, anybody who speaks against it is not acceptable. It became so evangelical that absolutely nothing else was heard. And as a result, some of the solutions that, that we found actually could have been avoided and a better solution had there be found had there been a scientific dialogue as free as it should be. You know how many scientists objected to that report on climate change. So when we look at this, we find that the debate is skewed and has become a faith, an article of faith rather than a scientific understanding of what is needed and how do we balance it with our development needs. Don't forget, particularly in our part of the world, we're a fairly poor country as yet. And there are lots of people waiting to come out of poverty. And poverty, mind you, is a curse. Every day we delay that, that, that many people have to suffer that horrible, cursed, cursed existence for 10 more years, 20 more years. And I think it's time for us to understand that when such is the calamity on one side, how much should biodiversity be, be weighed against it? It should be. There are areas that biodiversity must be paid attention to, but how much should it be at the cost of these people not being able to come out of poverty, of not being able to have prosperity enough to be able to build things? In fact, some of the biodiversity that you destroy actually produces nutrition for food. When you plow a field, you destroy biodiversity but it opens up the field to provide nutrition. So there is not everything that you disturb with the biodiversity is bad. At the same time, development is the only way we will bring prosperity and within the money to be able to clean it up. At one time, Lee Kuan Yew, the prime minister of Singapore, had said, 
okay, we will get a little uh, uh, unclean, and we'll clean it up afterwards like the West did. But we need to understand that the need of India is to provide for its people and get them out of poverty fast. And if it clashes with biodiversity, we must find the right compromises. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. I didn't have to press the button the second time. Vandana, please. The floor is yours. Oikos is the name of this beautiful home of ours, the Earth. And her web of life is woven by biodiversity. Oikos is the root of ecology which means the science of knowing how nature works. It's a science. Economy is supposed to be the management of the household. And if it did its work the right way, it wouldn't be destroying the biodiversity, which is the very foundation, not just of life, but of the economy too. Of course, the economy of two thirds of our country, the peasants, the fishermen, the tribals, the women, but all of the economy. Oikonomia is what the economy is supposed to mean. Aristotle defined it as the art of living. And you can't have an art of living if you don't know how to live with life of biodiversity. He had another name for what the honorable speaker was trying to de describe as the economy. He called it crematistics the art of money-making. Now, when the art of money-making destroys the very foundation of the economy, not only does the money machine stall, but as my research and science over five decades of dedicated work in ecology has shown, the formal economy that's measured leaves an ecological footprint of destruction 10 times to 100 times more. Let's take the issue of forests. It was assumed they were timber mines, till my sisters in the mountains, the Chipko movement, said their real gift is water and soil. It was a flood of 78 that woke up the government to realize that the economy of timber mining was very small compared to the diseconomy of the floods and the drought and then onwards, the Himalayan forests were supposed to be conserved for their function, for soil and water. It's a wake-up call for all of India this year with the massive flooding we are seeing. Or take the case of the way we look at forests. Yes, we grow food. I, in fact, have dedicated 35 years of my life to grow food in non-violent ways. We grow more food by building the biodiversity in the soil, by giving the soil organisms food, which is biodiversity itself. And the biodiversity of soil organisms increases production 300 times. When the biodiversity is intense in our farms, we have far more food production and nutrition. And we measure nutrition per acre, we can feed two times India's population, two times India's population by growing biodiversity. And the damages that are being caused by a system that has become blind to the ecological functions and the economic contributions of biodiversity has caused so much damage. We assume all of the species are our enemies and we develop instruments to exterminate them and we call it technological development. Insects are disappearing, among them bees and our pollinators. One third of the food we eat comes from them. An assessment of 2005 tells us that every year 153 euro, billion euro is the contribution to food of the pollinators. And as we make them disappear, the costs to the food system will be annually 310 billion euros. Land degradation, which the IPCC report of this year has recognized as the basis of the climate contributions 
The assessment are that the cost of land degradation, which includes the destruction of the biodiversity of our forests, of our farms, of our fisheries, it will be 23 trillion by 2050. If the destruction is bigger than what you have extracted, you're not running an economy anymore, and you're definitely destroying our home, our biodiversity. I'd like to now call on a second speaker for the motion, Mr. Mukundar. Thank you. I'd like to start with speaking about position of law, then go on to what is the role of economics, and finally two cases right here from the city of Bombay to illustrate the point, what is at, what is at risk. Firstly, what is the position of law? There was a seminal judgment in 2004 by Justice Ruma Pal and B. N. Sri Krishna in Supreme Court who relied on the Stockholm Declaration of 1972, which is de defined as a Magna Carta of our environment, and they relied on Principle 11, which says, environmental policies of all states should enhance and not adversely affect present or future development potential of developing countries, nor should they hamper the attainment of better living conditions for all. They, in fact, went a step further. They said, actually, they said all development is an environmental threat. Indeed, very existence, they added, indeed, very existence of humanity is a threat. However, there need not necessarily be a deadlock between development and environment. Then they wrote the operative paragraph, which you must focus on. Both development and environment must go hand in hand. In other words, Focus on this line, there should be development. They said there should be development while taking care and ensuring protection of environment. Hence, the law is very clear. It says there should be development. Let's look at economics. There's a much vilified uh, Kuznets curve, many leading economists. I'm an engineer, but I just sp I spent a lot of time reading this. Environmental Kuznets curve suggests that environmental development initially leads to deterioration of environment. Uh, 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 development leads to environmental degradation, which means economic development leads initially to environmental degradation. But after a certain level of economic growth, the levels of environmental degradation reduces. It is most likely that threats to environmental environment will continue till we achieve base per capita income levels as well as development levels. In effect, Kuznet argues the best way to protect environment is to ensure economic development. So the law is very clear, we should develop, economics is very clear, if you don't have economic development, you'll be destroying the environment and the biodiversity. Let me give you two instances from the city of Mumbai. Both these picked from print media, and I'm going to read them verbatim. These are not my words, these are the words of the reporters. First one relates to my fellow honorable speaker from HCC, the Worli Sea Link. Pride of Bombay. We all drive on it, each one of us in this room, and we feel our heart grow much fonder about the city. But what a miserable journey it had to undertake. There is a report in Mumbai Mirror, 1st December 2018, which states the following. HCC was awarded rupees 400 crore worldly ceiling project in 2000, but work could not start. Work, work could only start by 2005 due to protest by environmental and fisher folks, and the cost escalated to 1,600 crores and was fully operational by 2010. The second one is even more alarming. This is a title, this, this article is titled Four Square Feet of Corals, Over 20 Million Humans. Why India Cities Will Remain Miserable. This came in print. It's an article by Mr. Shekhar Gupta. Uh, 20th July 2019. This is on Bombay High Court order, stopping work on Mumbai's long delayed coastal road project. The judges have opined in that order that there is no conflict between environment and development. There is a need for balance and adherence to laws. They haven't stuck down the project on merits or of the feasibility or environmental damage, but on a technicality. The project, they say, got its clearance as, be as a road but it involves reclamation of land equal to 40 football fields, and hence, uh, they must come for clearance against a city project. But let me go up forward again to say what really. Now the project not only needs a clearance as a city project, city development, it also needs forest clearance. Why? Because there are corals. 
What is the size of corals? Two patches, 0.251 and 0.11 square meter, about four square feet of corals. A coastal road has been delayed. I repeat four square feet. Tata Chemicals has transplanted live corals from Andaman Nicobar Island to Gujarat coast. So in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Rather than coral versus human debate, it should be corals thriving and humans thriving. We have done it in our company and have demonstrated it. This is, and this project, the fact is this project will get built, the coastal project. A year later, 1,000 crores costlier, because people in condominiums and slums can wait and activists can save a victory. Who is to bear the additional cost? You all judge whether nation is being held to ransom or nation is being built on sound legal and economic principles. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker, Bittu Saigal. Well, I have a very straightforward proposition to make right now, apart from the proposition that we're debating. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. There is nothing, nothing that you can do to earn more money if the biosphere doesn't support you. This entire planet, the atmosphere that we have, the fact that we're the only planet that has a biosphere, biosphere, it sort of suggests that we bumped up monkeys, came up very late in life, and we now believe we have become nature itself. We are influencing not just how people do things, but whether they can do things or not. <clears throat> the proposition speaks of biodiversity concerns. What are these biodiversity concerns? Each one of us in our body, we are repositories of biodiversity. If you contemplate the falling of a leaf, there's a lot of campaigns against plastic today. But that leaf would remain like plastic, its cellulose content, if it were not, let's say, for a beetle here or a termite there. And how complicated is this? I can assure you it is far more complicated than the most complex organism that I can think of in the world, which is the brain. The termites don't have the digestive juices to, di to digest that cellulose and return it. It is bacteria in the gut of the termite that does that job. It's, it goes way, way beyond this. It is so complex. It is so complex that please accept the fact that bumped up monkeys don't know how to look after this planet. It is not a question of aesthetics. It is not a question of money. That old thing about you, can, you can't eat money. You might be able to buy food, but what happens if the food doesn't come up? Vandana is the person who actually has taught us most, that, most of what we know about agriculture. There is a gross misunderstanding, and it has been there since the Green Revolution. That misunderstanding has told us that our food security depends on chemistry. It does not depend on chemistry. It depends on biology. You can have any amount of food growing right here on the carpet if I use extraordinary amounts of energy. But when, the, when you have food from nematodes to all the soil organisms turning sunlight back into something which is of substance and the whole food chain comes through, we are a product of the food chain. We are not going to be able to survive on this planet because we do not have the science, we do not have the expertise, we do not have the experience. There's more. But on the food front, I would say, it is a gross misunderstanding to believe that the government feeds the people of India. It does not. Nature feeds the people of India. And it is a gross misunderstanding to, un to believe that if we did not do X, Y, and Z, we would starve to death, as Vandana said. The truth is that you take a simple thing. The mahua tree. The, the Adivasis worship the mahua tree. But even the Adivasis don't have planting in their culture. They depend upon a moth. They depend upon a bat to do the pollination like the bees do. And exactly the same way we love mangoes. It's an elephant that took the mango from one place, and I do this with 12-year-olds, 
I tell them he puts a big piece of shit down over there and the best fertilizer in the world, a new mango tree comes up. And every creature does the same thing, whether it's a monkey or a bird or a this or a that. This biodiversity has given us a platform to live with, to live on, to depend on. Asking to destroy this biodiversity in the idea of creating a strong economy would be quite similar to the idea of, let's say, taking a flight from here to there and saying, look, there's something wrong with the engine, one of, but the other engine will work. We don't know how to fix it, and we certainly don't know how to fix it on the run. I would say that there's a precautionary principle. If I'm wrong, if our side of this debate is wrong, then the consequence of that, that mistake we make is clean air, bird song. If you are wrong, the consequence of that is death. I don't think that's a risk I'd be ready to take. I wouldn't take a flight if I thought an engine wasn't good. Thank you, Bitu. Um, Rohit, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, uh, the show of cards that you initiated makes me feel like uh, Madan Lal or Mohinder Amarnath in the 1983 <laughs> World Cup with the West Indians already on top. And uh, I wonder whether I'm equal to the task. Suffice to say that uh, the entire premise of this debate is on the, the uh, word undermined. The premise of this debate is specious, in my humble opinion. It is meant to create an artificial uh, fight between two people, just as if to entertain uh, those people who are here in front of us. <laughs> and uh, we are doing a fair task, I hope. Uh, but uh, the, the only submission I have, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, the debate has been settled way back in September 2015 when the uh, Sustainable Development Goals were embraced by the entire planet, by the United Nations. Uh, my submission here would be, therefore, that, uh, and, and biodiversity includes letting the phone ring, uh, it would be, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, 17 parameters have been agreed by the uh, entire planet relating to sustainable development, and they are not at all undermining biodiversity, and biodiversity remains a factor of, say, poverty. Biodiversity remains a subset of hunger. I'm citing from the 17 parameters the world has already bought in, and I encourage everybody, irrespective of the cards you chose to flash, to go back and see how well the governments and the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the leadership of this planet have embraced all of this. And the question remains before us to see whether it is possible to continue this kind of debate and antithetical positions to our, to our advantage, or should we actually go out with a closer uh, understanding of how to go ahead and implement, how to enforce our, our rights as, as citizens, as Twitterati, as whatever else, health, education, gender, they are all captured by the concept of biodiversity. Uh, water, would anybody argue that water and the marine life that was alluded to is not part of biodiversity at, uh, uh, already? Uh, work and economic growth, energy, industry, and life below water, life above water, life on land that is, is that not already captured uh, my worthy opponents uh, I'm not allowed to name them, but honorable opponents, as per the House rules, uh, already on, uh, on biodiversity. So the entire premise of this business of uh, India's economic security is being undermined by biodiversity concerns is absolutely true. We are held hostage by uh, our own antithetical positions for the sake of it, Mr. Chairman. I would say that if I convert even one person to start thinking a little more inclusive, a little less of us as, say, Pakistan versus you being India, it will be a lot useful. Because, Mr. Chairman, ecology has ecology. And economy has absolute, absolutely half the word already inside it. And the subsets, the factors, the corollaries, the relativities, and the flows are what they are. Uh, I want to say that we put in, uh, in my company, one single tower. He referred to my worthy opponent, talked about the Mahwa tree. We put one tower in the middle of Tadoba in Maharashtra, and we found that 
an entire community today, the girls are able to download uh, signals for uh, textbooks. Uh, a watchman in the forest department was attacked by a tiger but could be transported back to the Chandrapur forest uh, alive and kicking good. He's uh, one month into recovery. And that community is fighting for biodiversity far better than those who fought us by saying, these guys are fine, they are good as museum pieces, let them be there in 0G connectivity. From 0G, they became 4G in a matter of 30 days. And the effects are there to see. I would only say, rather than put us in the box as another country, Tomao Gulshan e Lahore se chaman badosh. Hum aayen subay banaras ki roshni lekar, Himale ki hawao ki taazgi lekar, फिर से फिर किसके बाद हम करेंगे और पूछेंगे कि कौन दुश्मन है दुश्मन कोई नहीं है हम और आप एक हैं और ये डिबेट ना कह के अगले साल हमें डायलॉग करना चाहिए शुक्रिया थैंक यू एंड अ फाइनल स्पीकर फॉर द इवनिंग मिस्टर देसाई Mr. Chairman, uh, let me begin first by thanking the honorable speakers for the proposition on my right, thanking them for presenting so cogently the case against the proposition. <laughs> They've done it so well, because all of them have said one thing, which is that there isn't a conflict between economic security and uh, environment that the two have to go together. So there can be no way in which one can say that asking for the environment to be protected, asking for environmental security, stands in the way of economic security. So that at least they have accepted the, the fact that the proposition is incorrect. So good, I'm very happy with that. Uh, I'm happy because that's the truth. That is the reality. That is what sustainable development is all about. And uh, frankly, this is an advance. 20 years ago, if you were having this debate, the, what I would have heard from the honorable speakers on the right, if you like, is that development first, environment later when we are richer. Today, at least they say, no, the two have to go together. And the real issue, therefore, is what does this going together mean? What does it mean if you say that both the, the economic security and environmental security have to go together? Now, one could elaborate this in technical terms, and I will not do that. Let me focus just on, give you a couple of examples. One, a positive one. Uh, I've seen a study where somebody has compared agricultural productivity in cropland, which is surrounded by forested areas, trees, and cropland, which is not surrounded by any trees. And the fact is that the productivity of the cropland which is surrounded by trees is higher. Why? Because of the better pollination by birds and bees. Many crops are pollinated by birds and bees. Many, most of them are by insects, but quite a few by birds and bees. So that makes a big difference. In fact, today, we have a situation where in the Punjab, where the trees have all been cut down, the farmers are obliged to pay beekeepers from the Himachal to come down with their hives for pollination. That's the situation where, which we have ended up in by destroying the biodiversity. Had we followed a more integrated approach where we would have looked at biodiversity conservation and the demands for food production and other agricultural activities, and of course water management, crucial uh, additional point one should bring in, together we would have been better off in all areas, on the conservation area, in the production area, in the anti-poverty area, and all of that. So the real issue is how do we do these things together? A negative example. This year you've seen a whole lot of urban floods. You had the cerebral flood in Bombay in 2005. And this year I, I, one, one has almost lost count of how many places we've had floods in. And these floods are partly a product of an urban uh, design which is not mindful of the ecological dimension, the environmental dimension. But uh, Chennai had 600 lakes, barely a third of them survive now. Out of Bengal, uh, Bangalore's 200 odd lakes, only 10 of them have any real water there. 
wetlands in the Hyderabad have gone away. Mangrove swamps around Bombay have been disappeared. The entire BKC is built on an old mangrove uh, swamp. We are blocking drainage areas and so on. So if you are going to build cities without regard to what the environmental security demands, and part of that environmental security is protection of biodiversity even in a city areas, areas like mangrove swamps, uh, for instance, you will face these crises again and again. And these crises are going to get worse because the prediction of climate change is more rain on fewer days. And you're going to get more and more of these. So the urgency of combining these approaches in a coherent framework which addresses all of these issues together is perhaps even greater now than it has ever been. So once again, I thank them for uh, being so supportive of the, our arguments against the propositions. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly move on to the rebuttal round. Uh, Mr. Gulabchand, the floor is yours. Three minutes. It's extraordinary. Now we are told that we should go back to living like Adivasis. So that we can live like that better. And then we will be one with the biodiversity of the world. As though human beings are not part of that biodiversity and we now to be brought back to that level. Continuously <clears throat> creating a, a scare of everything getting destroyed that the economies, when they're built, they will destroy everything, and they will destroy biodiversity of the world. And constantly saying, creating this fear-mongering around it, and then demanding that this is right, and you've got to listen to us. I think we've got to be careful here. But we cannot just fear-monger. A few anecdotal circumstances given about this uh, item or the other doesn't necessarily make for a full argument. At the end of the day, Nobody has said biodiversity is not important. But is it that, and that important that there will be no development at all? What happens to those poor? When will prosperity come? What, will, what is the whole objective? Is it only to preserve a very, very ancient way of life, of living off the fruit and spoils of the forest? I think we need to understand that we do live in a modern world. Again, we are told about the same thing about mangroves. When the Bombay was seven islands, there were no mangroves. As we started reclaiming and make it into a, a full island, that at the fringes you started getting mangroves. Now, these things happen. So biodiversity also means when situations change, when land masses change, adaptation takes place. So whilst we should take care, we must also remember that biodiversity also takes care of itself. So in terms of looking at, we're sitting in this island. We're full of high-rise buildings. It's all very well to say that I will not fly, but everybody's coming here flying. So I think we need to be a little careful about being evangelist, about being too puritanical on the subject. And let us understand and give way to development with a concern for biodiversity. Thank you, Mr. Gulabchand. I request one minute. What the Honorable Speaker calls spoils of the forest are the gifts of the forest. They're the oxygen that the forest gives us. They are the stabilizing of the water functions. It is so recognized this year that it's the deforestation of the Western Ghats, along with the excessive dam building and the mining of the riverbed that has caused the devastation in the flooding again so soon after the last flood cost $3.5 billion. You need to add that to your sums. Learn a little arithmetic. The national flood destruction has already reached $7.4 billion, and the reason we are honored to have your, you, Mr. Chairman, is because the other proposed chair person is addressing the flood crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and we are told this is all uh, fear-mongering, but the disasters last year 
have already cost the world $160 billion. As I said earlier, the shadow of the destruction, not as fear-mongering, but as an honest calculation, the destruction of biodiversity, the costs, are much bigger than what you count as the economy. Whereas what you call the primitive tribal has built an economy whose positive functions, if you were to take, you'd realize that there isn't just a sacredness. And we are not evangelists, but we do treat nature as the very foundation of our existence. And we are a civilization that is called Aranya Sanskriti. We are a civilization that says, Vasudeva Kutumkam, all species are, have equal rights. None is less, none is more. And in terms of the biodiversity destruction, we've done a calculation. It's $1.3 trillion annually just for environmental and social destruction in India. The formal agricultural economy you count is nothing compared to that. And add to it the fact that when you kill the soil microbiomes, which is biodiversity, and you kill the 90% of us, which are the gut microbiome in us, because of the way your model of agriculture is going, we are a bundle of diseases. The figures, the global figures, endocrine disruption, 2.5 trillion, cancers, 2.5 trillion you will not be able to generate the kind of growth you're seeking to correct these damages. It is better to protect the biodiversity and reach goal number one, SDG goal number one, reduce the poverty. It's possible only through biodiversity, not through a coastal road. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mukundan. Honorable Speaker has referred to our side as supporting your side. Thank you so much. I think one thing we do know that uh, there is one obstructionist view of life and there is one inclusive view of life. No wonder you find us supporting you because we are more inclusive. <laughs> uh, le let me just start by saying, you know, uh, uh, the debate about microbiome, food production. My company is involved in food production. We know exactly how we saved India from literal destruction and dependence on PL 480. Many people here may not know about this. We had to wait for ships to arrive from US to India, and we got that green revolution going. Secondly, uh, microbiome research. We've got one of the finest research labs in Pune, where my company is working on microbiome research. We are working on human gut. We are working on the soil health. It is through technology we make progress not by making speeches of, on the basis of hypothesis which is not even tested. And I think we need to be very serious about when we flash 1.3 trillion on the basis of certain numbers. You know what happened to the CAG report. Where is the money gone? We all are waiting, right? So many things. They said, uh, you know, in terms of the mining leases, so it's a similar number like this. You can always drum up a number which is huge. But let's go back to basics. I always go back to basics. What does a common man want? Jobs decent livelihood and we need development for that but not at the cost which is what we are saying not at the cost of five issues which are important in day-to-day -day living air pollution he doesn't want air pollution water pollution waste management plastic electronic city waste resource efficiency recycle reuse circular economy and lastly biodiversity protection because Bioresource gives us a lot of benefits, including water and other access, which we need to recognize. What is the solution and what is the way forward? This inclusive side wants to propose that development is not at the cost of biodiversity, but you can't be obstructing development. That is our my, technology can help focus drive to renewables, solar power, electric vehicle, and shared economy. All this is going to help. Answer lies in three players in this area working together. That is industry social organization and government jointly leading the way to sustainable development. Hence, our proposition is till we reach five trillion economy, we will see this battle ongoing. Faster we urbanize, faster we go economically, better it be for environment and biodiversity protection. Let's face it, without development, there'll be no meaningful environment protection nor biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you.
Back to you, Bittu. At least on one thing we are agreed, that this is a false opposition. And let's put it like this, uh, the Honorable Speakers have spoken about economy and they have vociferously defended this. I want to explain one simple straightforward fact on biodiversity and food security. Take one example and extrapolate that across the country. Kaziranga. Kaziranga, the Brahmaputra, when it floods, it's got wetlands, it's got depressions, fish fingerlings come inside there, they feed on rhino dung, on buffalo dung, on elephant dung, and they turn into large fish, and India from Kaziranga is feeding Bangladesh. These are fish factories. These are not places where we want to just protect a one-horned rhino. I'm giving you a, two or three very quick examples of how biodiversity actually affects and in, enhances the precise things that the economists are telling us they need to do through the means that you are doing, which are failing. Take the mangroves. So there were mangroves. Where there were, where there were uh, islands, seven islands, they had more of a coastal area. There were mangroves around here. This is something that is clearly there. They were, they were there. There was no doubt about it. But what is the use of those mangroves? The, the, the essential thing right now that I see is that those mangroves are doing two things, which a cement structure can't do. Number one, it is allowing deep draft ships to come in because it's holding the soil back. Number two, all the Maharashtra Machimar Kruti Samiti guys are not going and holding out their thing, saying under food for work, give me food. They're actually getting the lobsters that we eat directly from those mangroves. Nature was made to have the cake and eat it too. Now, if you kill that golden goose, imagining that the goose gets you a lot of money, that's not going to work in the long run. There is also the question of equity. I do agree we can't fight each other. I do agree that we must come to some kind of conclusion at this point to suggest that environmental groups are overriding the economy, I have to say is a bit Dali-esque to me. At this moment in time, I cannot even start to tell you that even the most biodiverse areas, which are the sources of supply of water, 95% of the water that we get in our city comes from the forests and those forests are manufactured by the biodiversity from soil microflora all the way to the trees. Incidentally, the tree is biodiversity under the Wildlife Act as well. It's part of wildlife. We will not be able to survive. I do think there's one very clear last point I'd make. We have a problem. We have a, we have a problem with climate change. This climate change has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. Essentially, there is no technology available to human beings on Earth to bring the atmospheric carbon back down. I celebrate those solar panels, but the only way to bring it down is to allow biodiversity in the soil and biodiversity of plant life and the restoration of ecosystems. That is the only way that we will actually bring carbon back down and actually even have an economy. What is being passed off as development today, sir, ye vikas nahi ye vinash hai. This is destroying us. It is actually destroying us. And it is really destroying the equitable justice that nature intended all living creatures to have. Thank you. Thank you, Bitu. Right, the floor is yours. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> incidentally, the only one amongst the six of us, me inclusive, who does not have, uh, who does have a card, red or green, is Bittu Segal. <laughs> so, so we don't have one, we don't have a vote, but we leave it to you, sir <laughs> and madam. <laughs> मैं फिर बिट्टू सैगल साहब ऑनरेबल बिट्टू सैगल साहब से कहूंगा आ दोस्ती का हाथ बढ़ाता हूं मैं और साथ में ये भी कहूंगा कि प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड सर दैट 
praising the chairman is not going to change the motion. <laughs> Even I had uh, planned to do that, I must confess. I had got Amitabh Khan's book here, thinking I will praise him from here and have some brownie points. But I understand that Paul is a last minute induction. Thank you. And he hasn't even written a book. So, so I can't do that. Uh, with due apologies to Madam, Honorable Madam. Now, suffice to say that uh, biodiversity in my friends in Tadoba, and I want to place this on the table of the chair, uh, 800 people made this uh, submission on their own, that they want connectivity, they want development, they want their children to study, they want the, to run the gypsies and being able to get a call from somebody so that they can reach a, the, uh, the tourist on time. Uh, they want to be rescued by a doctor, and they will continue to, to protect biodiversity. There were people who wrote back to uh, my organization that, you know, they will turn poachers. But no, development and their economic security in this small village of Adegao with a footprint of seven villages led to, Mr. Chairman, sir, the protection of biodiversity and Vagdo and Madhuri and names who may not be familiar to you are tigers who stand protected by the community who call up no sooner they see the red light. And that, to my mind, is economic security for the communities who live there rather than those who come to this room, meaning to do well for those communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Desai. Uh, let, let me begin first by saying that I don't think it would be such a bad idea if we could live like a diocese. But uh, let's get on beyond that. I think essentially the point is not that we are against development, but that basically you cannot say that biodiversity is undermining development. It is the opposite, if anything. The proposition says it is undermining. It is not undermining it. It has to go together. And the important thing is, yes, we have to meet needs, but we must be creative in finding out how to meet these needs in a manner which combines uh, the concerns that environmentalists typically talk about with the concerns of development. Let me give you an example. New York City had to increase its water supply, which comes from lakes in the Catskill Mountains. And they had a proposal for a massive uh, water purification plant. Then at the suggestion of some environmental groups, they went to the Catskill Mountains and realized that the same result could be secured by simply persuading the people who lived around on those mountain slopes below, above the lake to vacate that area, rehabilitate that area, which would make the water clean enough to be taken directly and saving all of the investment in a very expensive power plant. Now that was an ecological way of looking at a solution for meeting a need. There are other examples that I can think of. Uh, one that I was particularly fond of is in Chicago. At the end of Riverside Drive, there's a colony with a lot of people living there, and all the cars would come racing down Riverside Drive and race into this housing area. They kept on widening the road to allow these cars to go through. And then one day, the municipality woke up because the old people's home sent a letter to them, said they wanted a bus to be able to go to the church across the road from their old people's home, because they could not cross the road. Then they woke up, and you know what they did? They narrowed the road. They narrowed the road so that the cars would automatically slow down, and then they used the space gain, putting green cover, and that green cover helped to absorb and slow down the rainfall runoff into the stormwater drains. That's another way of looking at it. So do not always look for engineering solutions. Think blue, think green before you start thinking gray. That is the message. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Can I have the lights on, please? Okay, so you've heard uh, all the speakers make their point and make their rebuttals. Uh, 
the floor is open now to some questions and uh, I would request that you say your name, ask your question and preferably uh, address it to one of the speakers. Yeah, get a mic. Hi, I'm Devi Goinka. I'm one of the petitioners against the Coastal Road Project. I'd be very happy to have a one-to-one -one debate with you anytime, any place. Like I've invited Shekhar Gupta, but he has not accepted that offer. The question is uh, to Mr. Nitin Desai. Uh, Nitin Bhai, if you actually integrate the loss of natural capital into the national economy, what would change in this whole model of development? And why has it not been done so far? And the question to this side is, how many planet Earths will you need if you continue with your model of development? There's a mic at your table. Just press that button. Yeah, you're right. The inclusion of the loss of natural capital, if we were to include in the GDP figures, would certainly give numbers which are substantially different. There is, in fact, a report for the government of India, uh, the committee chaired by Partha Das Gupta, on a green national accounts. It was supposed to be implemented, but so far it has not been implemented. And I think it must be because income is what you can con consume without depleting your assets. That is the economic definition of income. And if you define it as that, you must always include the erosion of natural capital as part of the cost that the economy has incurred. And for that matter, the accumulation of natural capital. That too can happen. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, so to Mr. Mukundan, on, you, know, you said that you know, for everything sort of goes with the premise of law. So uh, specifically for, uh, you know, I want to know in projects where then where coastal regulation zone guidelines or laws are not being adhered to, you know, but this, the project still gets steamrolled and go on. How do you, as citizens, uh, you know, how do we go, go and make the project adhere to what they should be adhering? Case in point, Metro 3, uh, muck excavation within 500 meters from, uh, you know, the marine drive. They don't have, at that time, they did not have, uh, you know, uh, yeah. CRZ, uh, yes, please. Can you answer the question? Yeah, let, let me just tell you what happens to human mind. We alternate between specifics and the general. When we want to address the general, people run to specifics. When we want to address the specific, they go to general. I think to finding a solution when you are addressing a specific, like a coastal road, we need to address that specific because then it cannot be generalized. A general issue, like for example, in New York, where they got with the community, worked with the community and found a solution, is a general issue or a general principle we all accept. It is for that very reason, industry, in fact, has been working with the government and with the non-governmental organizations. We have an initiative called Indian Biodiversity Business Initiative. It is, it is by the business, supported by government, with the inclusion of NGOs, so that we find better solutions, both in general and in specifics. But the problem is the rhetoric carries the day and it makes news headlines. It doesn't find creative solutions. If a project gets delayed for whatever number of square feet of corals, when we've done transplant, no, no, let, 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 let yeah, me. please, let the, let, 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 uh, let, let, let me. No, but you started with the coastal road and how you could actually, re yeah, let him, let him, f okay. Of course, uh, no, uh, no, I'll, I'll address your CRZ issue also. I did, I see, I, I, I'm actually heading the environment committee for the industry, so I do know all the rules. So let me just fundamentally tell, state that, that we must adhere to rules. There is no way you can short the rules. And in fact, when that coastal road was delayed on a technicality, I think it was done rightly. But I'm taking other specific issue for four square feet of corals. I think there are solutions available. Transplantation is available. You can identify species of snails and octopuses which are there, and you can actually recreate them and repopulate them after it is built. It is not as if you're going to deprive the nature. No one is working at cross purposes with nature. We all understand that. And we also understand there is only one planet. 
but the route to one planet is through technology route to one planet is through science when you got 7 billion people who need to survive we cannot survive on the basis which we don't find solutions for the problem and i think that is why we are saying constantly that this is not a debate issue it's a dialogue issue and i must uh, thank my honorable fellow speaker who highlighted this and industry is intensely in dialogue i think what we are saying is we are anyway marching in that direction we welcome more people who have other perspectives to come in the room and find solutions jointly thank you any other questions in the house can i ask the gentleman right at the back in red Good evening. I'm Aniket from Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mukundan. Uh, so you happen to cite the Environmental Kuznets Curve, uh, and you're saying that you head the Environmental Committee for the businesses. So Environmental Kuznets Curve has a lot of literature that, uh, including by Partha Das Gupta, that is that clearly uh, that Environmental Kuznets Curve is not a reliable hypothesis when it comes to you know a lot of cases apart from the one that Mr. Kuznets worked on. so like apart from the debate like do you really stand with the environmental business curve i said it's a much vilified curve i in fact stated that right at the outset because i've read the arguments in favor and against it even though i also said with a disclaimer i'm an engineer i'm not an economist to the best of my understanding i've tried to but let, let me also highlight this i think any development if if you if you looked at the debate which supreme court went through which i spoke to the first initial judgment was by justice kalla it is a very seminal judgment you should read it because it said even a blade of grass is life and it cannot be disturbed and when justice kalla's judgment came out what it led to was massive number of projects in this country got stalled because once a supreme court judgment comes which says even a blade of grass is life and it cannot be disturbed then you want build corridors through that area 25 kilometers from the you know boundary you cannot construct there are a whole series of restrictions which come in which is why it took so long till justice rumapal and bn krishna's judgment came wherein they said development also is part of the stockholm declaration and its principle 11 and we must look at it and i think it brought about a balance in the supreme court's view of life so i think we are we are saying balance is important in everything so i don't disagree with any of the statements being made on biodiversity but in the short run if you want to feed people we cannot go to natural farming we need certain kind of support system till we transition there i can tell you right now people are experimenting with hydroponics and aeroponics which are going to even give 10 times the productivity we are talking about so there are solutions but the solutions are going to come from looking forward not going back but at the same time whatever is left of the biodiversity we must protect it intensely thank you yes sir right here uh, i don't believe the big elephant in the room has been addressed and that is population we were 350 million people at independence we are now 1.3 billion how come isn't that the biggest threat to diver biodiversity and to the ecology how come that's not been addressed by any are you addressing this to someone i'm the whole pan all of them all okay. three all sides wonder you want to take that uh whether it's the indian population growth after the land tenure systems were changed with zamindari rules and the land grab of the british colonialism or the scotland high clear highland clearances the same policies that destroy the earth and her biodiversity are policies that uproot people and trigger population growth you must look at kerala how is it that it managed to reverse the growth trend and come to negative population through giving true security to people and economic security is in the life of biodiversity in the livelihoods of people in the basic protection of their rights that is the time tested way to not have coercive population control which has never worked but to have inbuilt regulation of populations because you don't need to have more kids all the time it's an insecurity as a peasant said in punjab when he was asked why do you have so many kids he said the rich landlord can get the next tractor i can only have the next child uh, chairman, thank you chairman can i oh. since it was the yes. whole i think this this um, side also has a view 
I, I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. Population is a big concern. I think uh, if you look at uh, uh, Mr. J.R.D. Tata, it was one of his passion to address it. And I think even in the judgment which uh, Justice Ruma Pal gave, she said humanity itself is a threat to biodiversity. I think we, we start with that basic understanding. But I think the fundamental way to address population is not by coercion. I fully agree with the uh, Honorable Speaker on the other side, but I would certainly say that education is the way. Educating girl-child is the way to pay forward. Wherever girl-child education has been pushed forward and the literacy rates have gone up, we've seen dramatic fall in lit, you know, fertility rates. And it is showing all over India except three, four pockets now. And I think it will get addressed as we focus on those areas. Thank you. Praveena. My name is, is Dominic, and I'd like to address this to Mr. Mukundan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although I'd be very happy to hear anybody on either panel comment um, if I would have paraphrased the motion as this house believes that India's wealth is being undermined by its preoccupation with its health <laughs> rather than this house believes that India's health is being undermined by its preoccupation with its wealth which of those two statements would you agree with more? Yeah, I, I think this is like posing a question which is going to be, either of the answers is going to be wrong either way. So <laughs> let, let, me, let me just say this. I think uh, inclusive and sustainable solutions will not say either or. It will say and. I think it is when we start the debate by saying, how is it can we go that corals can survive and humans can thrive, will we have better solution? Not corals or human. Not when health or wealth, when health and wealth. Hum log dono ki puja karte hai. Lakshmi, Saraswati, everything we worship. So that's why we got so many gods in India. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we'll move on uh, to the last part of the evening, which is uh, every speaker comes up. He, uh, they've heard other speakers, they've heard the audience, they've heard the concerns around the room. What are your conclusions? Mr. Gulabchan, first, yes. The discussion and debate this evening has been quite, quite informative and it throws up many issues. One is, everybody seemed to be concerned about the development as well. Whether it was those who were against the proposition, of course, those who were in favor of the proposition. And what it tells us is what exactly Mukundan just said, uh, uh, Honorable Mukundan just said. <laughs> I know it's funny to be called that, but nevertheless. Uh, just said that we have to think in terms of and and not or. Because we have to have development. It's prosperity that will bring a lot of changes, education and prosperity will bring in the right kind of balances so that we can afford to take care of our environment as we continue to develop our country. This is extremely important. Like some of the security in Kerala, which we talk economic security that came through some policies of Kerala, or was it jobs in the Middle East that brought that economic security? It wasn't India that created that security. So the issue is we need to create for ourselves when they get jobs here. And jobs have to be created here, which means there will be a confrontation with biodiversity concerns. And it's extremely important for us to sit together and find a way to address both. But when it comes in favor of development, where man will suffer, improve his life, then we will have to give way a little more to biodiversity. Thank you. Vandana. Uh, the Honorable Speaker is a little out of date. Keeps going back to 1972. We've had an Earth Summit at which our Honorable Speaker from this side had a very big role, which created two international laws, laws called the Biodiversity Convention and the United Nations Framework for Climate Change, and principles of 
Rio. Polluter pays and the precautionary principles. We've had a Rio plus 20 summit and we've not had the development goals for 2030. They are sustainable development goals for 2030, which won't happen if the very foundation of sustainability is destroyed. Mention was made of the Green Revolution. I happen to have switched from my physics to looking at agriculture and better ways to produce food without destroying the earth and our biodiversity and our health because of Punjab. It's today a destroyed land. There's a cancer train. The water's gone. The soils are infertile. The bees have disappeared. And every third young person in Punjab is a drug addict. That is not creating a good society. We need to start, like I said, doing full cost accounting and truthful accounting, not picking up the figures that are convenient and the figures in these externalities of industrial agriculture and wealth per acre are government statistics and the foreword is written by the agriculture minister. We are not cooking up figures. Sadly, those who would like to violate every law that's in place and violate every law of nature to constantly say there is something in which we can make our money, that we can recreate nature, therefore we can destroy the coral reefs, but you're saying the same for destroying the bees, and you want to create robot bees. Every place where technology as a little tool, a pathetic sad tool, that is so clumsy compared to the sophistication of the functions of biodiversity. Every time you talk that language, you are showing the ignorance about how nature works. And the only way to do farming to feed the world is to work according to those two iron laws of nature, the nutrient cycle and the water cycle. You violate them, you destroy the very foundations of foods production and of the economy. In the short run and in the long run, you will have to work with nature. You'll have to farm with nature. You'll have to farm with biodiversity. We don't just talk. I grow the food that way, and I hope you will become a Navdanya organic eater. Thank you. Mr. Mukundan, the floor is yours. I must thank the honorable speakers who come before me for laying the floor. We do sell organic food. <laughs> it's uh, sold as a premium, at a premium, and uh, we're struggling very hard to also make organic tea, but I'm, I can assure you that uh, this side will get it and do it. Uh, uh, but, no, we'll do it. Let me just tell you, for every critic who's sitting on the other side, we will welcome the dialogue. We will sit and talk, we will sit and listen. But our way is not just talk. We want to get it done in action, on the ground with people who need to develop. So all I would say is that I think all the voices are welcome, all the views are welcome, but at the end of the day, I think we must not forget that there are people and mouths to feed, and there is a biodiversity to protect, and they go hand in hand. And I think it is not that industry is today sitting on the fence industry actually is marching way ahead. And I think it is better to work with industry, which is looking in the area of development, and bring all the forces together in such a way that we have more benign world. And that's the inclusive welcome discussion which we would like to have. And I'd like to thank the floor and all the speakers for listening patiently to the cost it is having on nation, slowing down development. Uh, faster we grow, better it will be for us. Thank you. Thank you. Bittu? I haven't met an alcoholic yet who said that he cannot, you know, cope with this. I can have that extra drink. I can. And then the doctor tells him, your liver is dying. You're actually going to collapse. So he says, from tomorrow, I'm not going to drink whiskey anymore. Just can I switch to rum? It doesn't work. This planet is like our liver. It is self-repairing. It was made for us to have the cake and eat it too. But we are overwhelming it. And there is 
There are two examples I'd like to give, very specific examples. At this point, we have more than 3,000 large dams in the country. I think anybody would be hard put to give us an example of 30 out of those 3,000 that achieved their cost-benefit ratios. Either they're dying early or their, their conflict of power generation and flood control and drought uh, eradication is, is at, uh, at odds. There, is, there are solutions. There are very, very many solutions. I would ask my country today to repair the catchments of those dams. That is the way that biodiversity can come back. We do not know how to plant. If you go to the World Bank, they'll tell you to put toothpicks into the ground. They'll turn into tropical pine. They will not help biodiversity. They will not help water. I would urge the honorable members speaking for the proposition to please take a small humility pill. Accept that it is not possible and not within our capability to bring back that carbon. Think of this. I have 3,000 large dams. I put 25 million people back to work to bring the sponge back. I take the help of bees and butterflies and, and tigers and, and all those various things. In the process of giving those jobs, I bring the carbon down. I improve the lean season flows of water using biodiversity. The connections between climate change, biodiversity and water are as complete as the connections between your teeth and your gums. There's no point my having orthodontia if a gum disease is going to knock my gums out. And I don't think really that we should be arguing anymore. We don't have the time anymore to argue. And while a debate might go on at this level, simultaneously we are building huge amounts of dam at a huge amount of burrowing under glaciers that have already melted or are about to melt. Those are stranded assets. It's bad economics. Good biodiversity restoration is good long-term economics. I have a feeling that we have got a lot of work to do together. I hope we manage to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good. No notes, no books, nothing this time. <laughs> I took feedback on WhatsApp. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Bittu, not only for hosting us and for surrendering your card to the chairman. Thank you for also saying that you need our support. And that precisely is the point. The word undermined is redundant, specious, and can be given up at the end of this discussion. Let's call it a dialogue. Let's bring in the fact that India is already a signatory to the uh, convention on Biodiversity, which wasn't men mentioned in explicit terms at any rate. Uh, India is well aware of its developmental needs. Uh, our, not all our policymakers are as ignorant as some of us want to make them out when we stand in opposite directions in a debating format, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there is a pushback that Ketan and Dominic and Ankit and others who have said things here will ensure that Nothing in this country here on is being uh, undermined, uh, undermined, undermining, and all other uh, matters which, which come with development. Uh, there is a very robust uh, social media gang which works to the advantage of this country. And we, we are together because we are actually sharing the same planet. We use the same Mumbai Pune road. We don't walk. From the, from the walkaways, just as uh, we need other projects just to have a better life for not only ourselves, but my Tadoba example for those 800 villagers who signed and some who didn't sign, put their thumbprints here. We have a duty towards all of them as well and not merely to our uh, slightly evolved concerns where such debates uh, possibly allow us to come together and emerge with a greater show of reds and greens together. Ideally, don't take a choice, but flash both. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Desai. Uh, may I begin by saying that we are all clearly agreed that we have to get away from the, the word or to the word and that it has to be something where we don't talk in terms of an adversarial attitude. 
Well, let me just say here that when you say that environmentalists are obstructionists, the reality of decision making in India is that practically all environmental objections have been overruled. Yeah. This is the reality. That if you look at the clearances which have been given, if you look at the measures which are being now being taken to dilute the forestry laws, uh, I would say it would be a mistake to ask, say that it is somehow that it is the environmentalists who are standing in the way of uh, uh, development. I know of not too many instances. Yes, delays uh, may be there because of what is required. Let me look on a more po positive note. I think it's important here to recognize that we are working, moving to a world where we are all going to be living much closer to limits. <coughs> it's not just climate change. You see the scale of biodiversity loss. You see at the scale of the, uh, in, uh, you know, the injection of exotic substances like plastics into the ecosystem. We are talking in terms of 8 million tons of plastics entering the oceans, adding to the 150 million tons. We're going to be living much closer to these limits. It is therefore terribly important that whatever we do at the corporate level or at the public policy level, reflect a spirit of co -op precaution. We are asking people to take action before the worst effects are seen. How do you do that? You can do that by at least having a process where people agree on facts. People agree on the underlying science. If you do not have that, then we will continue to have these adversarial uh, arguments again and again and again. But I think it needs adjustments on all, uh, everywhere. Not just, uh, I don't think, in many ways you can say, yes, we are evangelists. We are the bhakti cult, which is trying to civilize the Brahminical uh, approach to development. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that it, there is, the adjustments, I believe, are greater at the end at which the decisions are being taken in government and in corporations than at the environmental end. Environmentalists in India have done a damn good job so far, and I hope they continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we've uh, had a wonderful evening. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's no denying that uh, both sides had their job cut out. Uh, and now you know why both sides have to be addressed as honorable. They've done a fairly... <laughs> honorable job of defending their positions. Uh, all I would say is, uh, you know, before I ask for the cards again, uh, a very, very big thank you uh, to Sanctuary Nature Foundation for having bought this. A big thank you to both the sponsors, Godridge and Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies and to all of you for taking the time out to be here and to the organizers and to NCPA for allowing us the use of this beautiful cozy facility. Um, before we uh, go, I would like uh, a show of the cards, please. All those who support the gentleman on the right. Yeah, first only those supporting the... Okay. <laughs> okay. And those supporting. Well, I, I, I would say that I, I see the odd extra green, even though the room is overwhelmingly red. Uh, and I think uh, there is a, a job well done today on, for the proposition. Uh, but I must also thank uh, such a spirited, you know, opposition and rebuttal uh, from the panel on this side. Uh, there is no denying that we have a task on our hand uh, as a collective group. Uh, this is not an easy challenge. Uh, there is a lot of stuff we are losing on this journey of development. And I think it's best that we recognize the need for sensitivity and balance but at the same time appreciate what we are losing and the pace at which we are losing it and do something quickly about it. Thank you once again.